Hi everyone, thank you, uh, the FMX, FMX team, for having me. I'm really happy to be here to provide you uh, a human rights activist perspective on why decentralized governance is really important. Uh, and then I want to lay out the case for what happens when we use too much centralized technology, and I want to lay out what I see as a, a lot of promise and potential uh, for decentralized technology, or what I like to call anti-authoritarian technology. And, and I will focus a lot on Bitcoin in this presentation. And I think this is really critical right now because we are at a point where I have to turn on the clicker. <laughs> it's the hottest part. We're at a crossroads. So all of the interactions that you have with the other humans in your life, your family, your friends, the people uh, that are in your local government, in your federal government, these interactions, whether they be financial, health, communications, location, all these things are either going to be surveilled, censored, treasonable, policed, or you're going to preserve some sort of level of liberty, freedom, and sovereignty over those decisions. And this has a lot to do with the um, world that, that we build. So, you know, humans over many thousands of years, uh, after the agricultural revolution, have always lived in a hierarchical, top-down um, power structure. So, a uh, centralized world is where one person, whether it's a king or a tyrant or you know, a lord, would have control over the laws and the news and the money um, and, and, and all different kinds of data. Uh, when it comes to what we've built uh, over the last few hundred years, uh, we have a world now where about 90 countries live under a, a decentralized power structure. So, you have courts, you have the media, you have the private sector, you have the executive branch, you have the legislative branch. Um, you even have civil society. You have all these different things balancing out the executive power. And I think this, is, this has gone uh, a long way towards making the world a much better place, a much more innovative place. If you look at everything from um, healthcare, uh, life expectancy, uh, innovation rates, patent rates, uh, the correlation between free societies and dictatorships is really, really strong in favor um, of countries that are, that are decentralized. Now, the people who have tried to control you and to control your family and to control society over the generations uh, have always tried to figure out new and different ways of uh, basically consolidating power, right? So this is a sketch that the philosopher Jeremy Bentham made uh, several hundred years ago. It's the Panopticon. So it's an imaginary thing he drew up uh, that would allow the state to basically put its uh, critics in, in a prison and have a constant watchful eye over them. Um, when it comes to how this was implemented uh, over time, uh, this is actual Panopticon that was built off the island of Cuba uh, maybe a hundred years ago. Obviously, it's fallen into disrepair, but the idea of omniscient surveillance has evolved, um, especially in China. So in the world's largest country, and I think I'm going to focus on the world's largest country for a little bit because I think it's important that we spend a little bit of time thinking about what more than a billion people have to live through every day. Uh, it is something where whatever you're doing, again, whether it's financial, healthcare, location, health data, all these things get sucked up into a giant surveillance cloud, uh, and then the government, uh, through it, the companies that it, that it controls, uh, gets to analyze you and gets to basically start controlling you in ways that we can't even imagine here in a place like Switzerland. Um, and this, in an essay in Foreign Affairs this summer, uh, was termed digital authoritarianism. And for a human rights activist, this is like one of the biggest threats to uh, our time as, as humans. So one of the tools that the Chinese government uses to collect all this data uh, is called WeChat. So this has more than a billion active users. So to put that in perspective, these folks use uh, WeChat on average two, three, four hours a day on average. So hundreds of millions of people are on this all the time. You can do your shopping. You can choose where you're going to go hang out with your friends tomorrow. You can talk to your family. You can take out a loan immediately. I and mean, you can do things that social media in America or Europe can't even dream of doing. WeChat is just better. Um, but, you know, when, when, when you really think about the granularity, I wanted to share with you this quote from someone who wrote an essay. This is someone who lives in, in Shenzhen. I use WeChat to message a friend while standing in the middle of a rice paddy, to pay for snacks and water in a remote village, to buy train tickets, to book hotel rooms, to order taxis, to get takeout, and to send my aunt photos. If I wanted to, I could also use it to pay electricity bills, top up my mobile phone account, make hospital appointments, and check the weather. But what if your government was using this super app to monitor every aspect of your daily life? Then you might think twice about 
uh, the positive impact that this could make on society. This was actually laid out in, about four years ago by the Communist Party in something called the Planning Outline for the Construction of a Social Credit System. So in order to start assigning people numbers, uh, that would essentially be like a loyalty scheme. So you can think of like a frequent flyer uh, club number uh, where the more points you have, the better benefits you have inside the, inside the airline. Well, this is like in society. So the more loyal you are to the government, the more benefits you get. Fast internet, better rates on loans, uh, ability to travel abroad. Um, and Xi Jinping's manifesto is to allow the trustworthy to roam everywhere under heaven while making it hard for the discredited to take a single step. So this was actually baked into the... Um, into the policy planning uh, of what they're doing right now. Uh, this is an example of one of many different credit scores. I think it's like a myth that there's one big credit score. It's like very distributed, uh, very fragmented. The New York Times calls it Kafkaesque and not Orwellian because a lot of it just doesn't work yet. Um, but th they're going to try and make it work. And you know, essentially, this particular one turns you into a number between 350 and 950. And that determines, again, what kind of benefits you can have. Uh, in some cities, this is a city of more than a million people, um, the best scorers or the best citizens actually get put up on giant posters around the city, Hunger Games style, so that other people are like, wow, I want to be like them. So again, this is like so much more powerful than disincentives are, are incentives. I mean, you really want to get people to buy into the system. Here's an example of, and here's an example of the disincentives. So here's an instance where if you jaywalk and you break the law, your, your, your name and ID number go on a screen so that everybody can see you. So this idea of like publicly shaming people is also very important. So they use this mix of carrot and sticks to keep people loyal. Um, and in this case, you know, bad citizens are on display for, for everyone to see. Um, I thought this quote was really powerful from a Chinese millennial, a 23-year-old student. She said, whether we're constructing a futurist society or a cage for ourselves, I cannot tell. And of course, she's here using um, her phone to make payments. Obviously, China's the biggest mobile payment uh, country in the world by orders of magnitude, uh, way ahead of anyone else in this industry. But again, this is being done with highly centralized technology. Um, this is a, a journalist in China who fell uh, on the wrong side of the social credit score, and he actually got blacklisted. So he can no longer board a flight, a train, he can't send his young daughter to private school. This is having a real impact on people. Um, and you know, this is this sort of thing that could come to any society. Don't think this, you know, oh, it's going to happen in China, it won't happen in Europe. I mean, don't be so sure. Uh, again, you know, the, the operating principle is once you're untrustworthy, you're always restricted. Very, very, very uh, easy to go down in the system, kind of hard to work your way up. Um, and this uh, innovation isn't just in the social credit sector, it's also in the surveillance sector. So China has said publicly that it wants to have one billion surveillance cameras by 2020 and that it wants to lead the world in AI by 2030. So this is a pair of uh, sunglasses that are obviously sort of like smart sunglasses that this policewoman is wearing. and. You know, when, when she um, looks at somebody, it pops up with all sorts of data. So this is like uh, what this looks like in action. This is actually from one of these companies at a demo, showing people uh, what their technology can do. So it's just this one camera, but it can immediately spot all these people and tell you valuable information about them. So there's hundreds of millions of these cameras being set up all over the country. Uh, and, you know, some of this stuff is getting really experimental. This just looks like a toy, but it's actually... Uh, an example of a surveillance drone that looks like a bird, and these things can fly so lifelike that other birds actually flock with them when they fly. And they've been rolled out in 30 provinces in China. I mean, so, so the authorities are really working on this idea of omniscience. And again, this is something that's going to spread to other countries. It's not just, this isn't just a conversation about China, it's about a conversation about the world. Um, to this point, they even have pre-crime. So obviously when your credit score gets low enough, you start getting suspected for things even though you haven't done them yet. So we might think this is like a sci-fi movie like Minority Report or something out of a Philip Dick novel, um, but this is reality for, again, the world's largest population. So I, I wanna kinda make a, a, a plea to you about be careful what you invest in. Um, centralized technology is making this reality possible, and, and this talk in a lot of ways is about why I think we need to really focus on decentralized technology. Um, the final example of, of what could happen if we let too much power go into the hands of the people who make technology is in Xinjiang. So Xinjiang is a massive province in the northwest of China, it's north of Tibet. There's about 20 million Muslims who live there. They're called the Uyghurs. They're a, a minority population. And this is pretty much the, the most surveilled place on earth. Um, so in Xinjiang, when you go uh, outside of your home or your office, like 100 meters, 200 meters, um, 
the police are alerted. If you, if you don't install tracking software on your phone, um, you get arrested. And if you pray or grow a beard, you, you can get sent to one of these prison camps. So to give you some scale, um, and these, again, are very different prison camps, but I just wanted to give you a data point. So in World War II, at the peak of Nazi Germany, the most people at any one time that they had in a prison camp was about 715,000 people. Today, there's more than a million Muslims in the prison camps in Xinjiang today. This is a number from the United Nations. I mean, who knows how large the actual number is. Uh, and this just is something for you to think about when, you know, be careful what you're building. So a lot of what the Chinese government is using to put these uh, Muslim minority citizens into these camps is, you know, highly advanced centralized technology. Um, and again, who's it targeting? It's not just religious minorities, it's gays, lesbians, uh, other religious minorities, other um, people who are free thinkers, poets, students, activists, etc. Um, it's not just a problem in China. This sort of model of like highly centralized data control is, is going uh, across the world. We have it being implemented in Ethiopia, Iran, Russia, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Vietnam, uh, different countries in Africa. So this is really happening around the world. And of course, in Western societies, in America and Europe as well, we have our problems with centralized data. Uh, of course, there's been election interference, and most recently, in the last 24 hours, a massive hack in Facebook, which exposed the uh, vulnerabilities of information of more than 50 million people, okay? Um, this isn't unprecedented. Last year, Equifax actually um, had a breach where more than 140 million Americans uh, had their uh, social security numbers, home addresses, phone numbers, breached to the world. Um, this is a reality that a lot of people are assessing as being problematic, having all data in one place. Um, there's a lot, people are kind of short on solutions, I would say, but, but in terms of addressing this as a problem, I think the world is starting to come to a consensus about this. This is uh, Jaron Lanier, a very famous uh, technologist and philosopher who gave a talk at the TED conference in Vancouver earlier this year. This was the most celebrated talk of the conference and he gave a manifesto about we need to build a new decentralized internet where when I communicate with you, our interaction is not profitable or policed, you know, that we would control that interaction. Because what if you could control your own data? I mean, that, that would really make the Chinese government or any government around the world's panopticon impossible and I think that's very important for us to think about as we build and we create the architecture for new technology. Um, I'm a student of political science. I've been working at the Human Rights Foundation for 10 years. My field is not technology. Um, my field is not uh, cryptocurrency, although I'm a very avid student of it. But I, I do know a lot about uh, the way that governance works in, the, in political science. And obviously, uh, dictatorship is easier. You can do a lot more transactions per second with, in dictatorship. Uh, you don't have to deal with courts or private property or the media, you can just do whatever you want. However, there's incredible beauty and power in decentralized governance. As I mentioned before, if you look at the facts in terms of everything from patent rates to healthcare to life expectancy to what these societies add value to, to, to society, what we do as a species, I mean, I, I think that uh, the evidence is quite clear that decentralized power with checks and balances is really important. Again, there's a beauty in this, and there's a beauty in a system that no one owns. Again, it took humans so many thousands of years to figure out how to create governance structures um, that didn't have one person in control, and I think that's a real evolution. I really wanted to read this quote to you from Yuval Noah Harari, uh, the, the author of Sapiens, the famous anthropologist. If you dislike the idea of living in a digital dictatorship or some similarly degraded form of society, then the most important contribution you can make is to find ways to prevent too much data from being concentrated in too few hands and also find ways to keep distributed data processing more efficient than centralized data processing. These will not be easy tasks, but achieving them may be the best safeguard of democracy. Now remember, this is someone who probably knows nothing about your industry at all, but clearly this is something that you all can help with. Um, before we get to efficiency, let's talk about the system itself. Now as an activist, as a human rights person, as a free expression person, I was really fascinated by Bitcoin. And, you know, my interpretation of it is, a decentralized money network where I can send a transaction to anywhere else on the earth and no one can stop that. No sovereign government can stop that and that, that's a radical innovation. You know, until Bitcoin, I, you know, I really don't think humans had a way to globally transact other than to trust a third party. I don't think you could say that unstoppable money existed. And so I think this is a revolutionary upgrade in how actually humans interact with each other. It's just the beginning. Um, if you go back to Yuval Noah Harari and read his masterpiece, Sapiens, you'll learn about the cognitive revolution, which happened 70,000 years ago, which allowed humans 
to start telling stories and break the Dunbar number and assemble in groups of larger than 150. You know, then about 12,000 years ago, we had the agricultural revolution, which for better or worse put us into hierarchical power structures, villages, towns, cities, empires. And then a few hundred years ago, the industrial revolution, uh, which enabled us to go from just a half, a couple hundred million humans to, to more than seven billion in just a few hundred years. Um, each one of these revolutions was an upgrade in how we could network and interact with each other as humans. So I submit to you that maybe, you know, in 2009, the invention of Bitcoin as the first time that humans could really interact with each other without having to trust a third party, and, and while knowing that that transaction would go through, is the beginning of something similarly important. Um, even within the Bitcoin community, you know, my interpretation, again, is as a political scientist, I'm looking at how governance works inside Bitcoin, it's so interesting to me. I really think of the miners as the executive branch, the coders as the legislative branch, and the users as the judicial branch. You, know, you, can't, you can't just force things through in this governance model. You have to really have consensus, and I think you've seen that in the last couple of years. It's, it's always interesting to me to look at this from a political science angle, but I think there's something in this governance model that's very stable and very, very worth looking at. Um, I also think it's important that people go back to the beginning of Bitcoin, to the first block in the Bitcoin blockchain, and actually look at the clue that Satoshi Nakamoto left for us. You know, this is a, an article that says, the Times, 3rd of January, 2009, Chancellor on the brink of second bailout of banks. And it, it refers to this actual article from the Sunday Times in the United Kingdom, which criticized the role of central governments in just printing more money when they had economic crises. Now, of course, in free countries, in democracies, you know, we can, we can say for sure that central banking has, has been certainly positive and has, has helped society. Um, but in the same way, we have to understand that the world isn't all like Switzerland. Um, and, and I do think that in the same way that the internet disrupted information monopolies and now rich families and states are not the only people who can make news, I think Bitcoin's going to disrupt financial monopolies in the same way. Um, and it's going to start with the worst excesses of financial monopolies. So hyperinflation here in Europe, of course, uh, not that long ago, you know, you know, contextually speaking, there was massive hyperinflation in Germany before World War II. Um, and then in Africa, only 10 years ago, uh, the Zimbabwean dollar, which at one point was worth two U.S. dollars, uh, became completely worthless, and they had to print notes that said that, that this would be worth one trillion dollars and even one hundred trillion dollars. Um, today in Venezuela, that's how much uh, a roll of toilet paper costs you in bolivars. And this is actually a photo from last month, so the actual amount of money that you would need to buy this toilet paper is much larger now. Um, to give you an idea of the scale and speed of this hyperinflation, in 2016 it cost 450 bolivars to buy a cup of coffee in Caracas last year, 4,500 this year, 1.4 million. So the International Monetary Fund has predicted that the Venezuelan inflation rate will reach more than a million percent by the end of the year. So if you had a million dollars, you just have one. Um, this, is, this is quite bad. Um, but you know what? People in Venezuela are using Bitcoin as an escape valve from this, and they're using it as a store of value, which is something that we should pay attention to because it's, it's actually happening. This is a real-world example of like blockchain and how people are using it. Um, it may not matter to you. I know people in Europe and America get very skeptical of this, but uh, I think a lot of that comes from the fact that they have a working financial system. Everybody in this room, most of you, live in a country where you know your money is a store of value. You have depositor insurance. Your bank's not just going to come steal your stuff. But most people in the world don't have this luxury. This is a map produced by, by, by my organization, the Human Rights Foundation, that looks at, generally speaking, which governments are highly centralized and which governments are, are more distributed. So in the red countries, one party or one organization holds all the power. And what's really interesting is that in these countries, um, the, the, there's no separation of uh, money and state. So in the red countries, pretty much uniformly, um, the executive branch, whoever that is, a king or a junta or a military dictatorship, can decide to print more money. And that leads to a lot of bad consequences for citizens. Um, I would, I would sort of submit to you that Bitcoin, Ethereum, and other decentralized networks are, are sort of most useful where you can't trust your banking system. I don't see these things really taking off in terms of operation and people using them in free countries right away, um, I, but I really see them already, already having a massive impact in places that are authoritarian, especially places like Iran, Venezuela, uh, China, uh, Turkey. Um, I wanted to tell you one little story from a friend of mine. Uh, Roya Mahbub is one of Afghanistan's first female tech CEOs, and in 2014 she had to pay girls that she had taught how to code who were doing work for her for her software company. And because of sanctions, she couldn't use PayPal. Um, and of course, the women weren't allowed by their brothers and uncles and husbands to go open bank accounts because they want to control all the money in the family. 
So she actually started paying them on Bitcoin, and the husbands and brothers and uncles had no idea what this was, uh, and it was just on their phone and a hot wallet, and, and they didn't control it, so it actually gave these people um, sovereignty over their money. Now, one of the young women that worked for Broya had to flee the country because of political threats, but she brought her Bitcoin with her by foot over Iran through Turkey, and she settled in Germany where she was able to actually use that Bitcoin, which had luckily appreciated a lot over time, uh, to start a new life. And I think this is like one little example of how, what kind of freedom this can give to people. The, this story would not have been possible, you know, 20 years ago. Um, now, despite the fact that it has a lot of like revolutionary positive impact, I think a lot of establishmentarians are petrified of Bitcoin in different ways. So you have people um, like, of course, this famous personality calling for a crackdown on Bitcoin. Um, and then, of course, the European Central Bank has been pretty skeptical, right? So this was something they did a few months ago, which I thought was funny. Uh, you know, telling you why Bitcoin's not a currency. You know, this is like a, a non-ironic post that they had on Twitter, um, which I thought was funny. So, so why would um, establishmentarians do this? I think there's two reasons. Number one, it erodes their power. So that's something they're worried about. But number two, they're trying to build private uh, enterprise versions of, of Bitcoin, and that's really important. So, um, you know, Bitcoin and Ethereum, as, as probably most of you all know and love, are open, decentralized, permissionless, and censorship resistance. This is, this is something we really haven't had before. This is pretty cool. But enterprise blockchains are closed, centralized, permissioned, and censorable. Not cool for like entrepreneurs and individuals, but very cool for governments. Um, you know, with an enterprise blockchain, from an engineering perspective, you get the worst part of Bitcoin, the inefficiency, and, and you don't even get the prime benefit, which is censorship resistance. So, you know, from an entrepreneurial perspective, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but from a government perspective, it can make a lot of sense. Um, in China, uh, the, Xi Jinping has said in May in a huge speech that, he, that blockchain is a breakthrough technology. Jack Ma has said that Bitcoin is a bubble, but blockchain is for real. Uh, and the Chinese Communist Party's television station ran a big special that reached hundreds of millions of people that said blockchain will be 10 times bigger than the internet. Um, and if you look at the patent applications in China, they're just crushing the rest of the world when it comes to blockchain. Um, but again, these are blockchains with what they say, this is a quote from a Chinese official, blockchains with Chinese characteristics. So they say that the blockchain still has a center and that it's not really about decentralization and it's really about transparency and accountability, which is great except for the fact that they can behind the scenes go and edit all the records because they're not open permissionless blockchains. So we have to be really careful about what kind of blockchains we are building. Um, China's not the only government that's building its own controllable blockchain. The Venezuelan government announced uh, you know, six months ago that it was launching Petro, which was going to be a, a coin tethered to the price of oil. And really, it doesn't function or operate, but it was a way for them to raise a lot of money from China and Russia. Um, so just as the Venezuelan people were um, escaping from financial repression with Bitcoin, the government was building Petro to, to try and keep itself in power. Now, in Saudi Arabia, you have IBM very excited about working with the Saudi government to reimagine and transform the way in which services are provided to citizens. You know, this is a government that crucifies people. This is a government that arrests female uh, activists who are fighting for the right to drive. Uh, this is, this is a, a brutal dictatorship, to be frank with you. Um, I mean, it's pretty crazy that a company like IBM would be really excited about working with Saudi Arabia. Usually when you do this business with the Saudi government, you have to like sweep it under the rug. But for some reason in the blockchain space, people are like super excited about it. So I'm hoping we can have like a little bit of morality here. And the great question is, next time you get invited to um, a conference in Riyadh or Moscow or Beijing, and, and it depends, of course, there could be good conferences in these places, but like, you really gotta ask yourself, what would Satoshi Nakamoto do? You know, he, he, he or she or whoever it was that invented Bitcoin, whatever group of people or whoever invented it, uh, obviously meant it as a tool for liberation, not for control. Um, when it comes to centralized systems, obviously they can be great. I'm not an anarchist, I don't think everything should be decentralized. Obviously, Estonia has a beautiful and, and very exciting uh, visual e economy with a virtual residency program. And these things are good because we trust the Estonian government. The Estonian government's not going to come kidnap me in the middle of the night if I criticize it. But what if Putin invaded Estonia tomorrow? You know, a, a centralized system is only as good as the humans behind it. And remember, Putin is someone who was dancing at the Austrian foreign minister's wedding not that long ago. Uh, he's already invaded several countries in the European area. Uh, the idea of him invading a Baltic country is, is not unfathomable. Um, and if he did that, or if he somehow took control of one of these countries, he could actually start using it uh, as, a, as a way of like, creating a dragnet and persecuting his critics. So, so let's be careful. Now to go back to the idea of cash, 
Uh, this is another scene from China. Again, people are using cash, not just there. In Venezuela, the United States, uh, more broadly, um, 95 plus percent of all transactions in most countries are all digital already. So um, I think I wanted to show this quote from David Chong, uh, it's sort of one of the original pioneers in this field, that the difference between bad and well-developed digital cash will determine whether we have a dictatorship or a real democracy. And I really believe that quote. Um, it's actually a beggar in China who, who's begging with, with his uh, WeChat uh, QR code uh, and not with coins or paper metal money. I mean, this is a society uh, here in Switzerland, America, China, wherever you are in the world, where in 10 years, we're not going to use paper money. We're going to look at it and be like, that's ridiculous. It's all going to be digital. So we have to be really careful about what kind of cashless society we want to live in. Is it one where we have some sort of privacy, sovereignty, control over these things, or is, are we ceding it all to the companies and governments? Um, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who you might know from his black swan theory, I mean, one of the world's top intellectuals, has said that Bitcoin's mere existence is an insurance policy that will remind governments that the last object the establishment can control, namely the currency, is no longer a monopoly. This gives us, the crowd, an insurance policy against an Orwellian future. I think that quote's really powerful, and it's interesting that he would choose Bitcoin to, 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 to focus on with this, and I think it's something we should consider when we reflect on how Bitcoin operates, um, who makes the decisions in it, what its government structure is, etc. Um, I want to talk a little bit about scaling, because of course if only just a few people can use Bitcoin, it's not very helpful. I would posit to you that I think, like many others, that, that Bitcoin is sort of in the 1980s, 1990s, maybe early 1990s. Uh, obviously with the, the evolution of the phone, um, it went from something that was absurdly expensive, that only elites could use, that making a phone call was laughably expensive, and the battery life was terrible, the usability sucked, it was huge and ugly. Now everybody's got a phone. I mean, not just us in this room, but people in the middle of the jungle, desert, in any country, have some sort of smartphone, and they do more than just call with it. They do banking, etc. I think you're gonna see a similar evolution over the next 15, 20 years. Um, but to do that, we have to go over some major engineering challenges. So Nick Sabo has said that greatly sacrificing computational scalability in order to improve social scalability was Satoshi's brilliant trade-off. So, you know, the prime advantage of Bitcoin is not speed, it's not efficiency, uh, it's not that it's inexpensive, it's that it's censorship resistance. That's what made it so unique. Um, now, when we look at this, comparatively speaking, we have Visa at 2,000 transactions a second. Uh, but those are censorable, freezable transactions. You know, Bitcoin can only do six to 10, but those are unstoppable, so they're very valuable. So the question is, with, with another kind of technology, perhaps Lightning Network, could we have exponential and unstoppable transactions? So the answer right now is maybe. Um, this is a map of the Lightning Network about a month ago. Uh, what you see there are the nodes. And what's really interesting to me is that on the Lightning Network, it's actually possible to stake your Bitcoin and provide services and, and gain interest without giving up control. So if you take 0.5 Bitcoin and you stake it into the Lightning Network and open up a hub and a payment channel for other people to use, you can actually start making money off their transactions through you and you've never given up the private keys to your Bitcoin. This is really interesting when it comes to finance and assets. It's like giving up your house uh, or your gold or your whatever uh, without having to give up ownership and make money off of it. Not something that was possible before, but something that might be possible in this new financial era, which is pretty exciting. But if we don't explore and invest in, in decentralized or what I like to call anti-authoritarian technology, whether it be IPFS or Bitcoin or encrypted communications, all these things that are really powerful and positive for individuals, you know, the WeChat model is probably going to win. So we have a lot of work to do. Um, I want, I, this quote is great. The best time to care about the human impact of e-commerce networks was 20 years ago. The second best time is today. So again, there's an urgency towards building this stuff in a way that's going to preserve a, a future that has... Um, some sort of decentralization, freedom, and privacy. Um, we can't rely on the establishment to do this. We have to come together as a community here in the industry um, because if we leave it up to the governments, they're not going to do it on their own. These are the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And if you actually read them, there's about 10,000 words that describe all the goals. Um, and the, the, the words democracy, corruption, journalism, not mentioned. Okay, This is, a, I would argue, you can do a lot of good by investing with, with these as your like North Star but it's gonna be an incomplete picture of humanity. Uh, you won't get anything regarding uh, strengthening civil liberties, democracy, uh, uh, election technology, uh, you know, journalism, free speech. None of that is included in the SDGs. 
So I, I would argue that some of the technology you're looking at investing in, maybe put, maybe put a hat on and say, well, maybe I'm not looking for the biggest or fastest or cheapest. Maybe I'm looking for the freest. And maybe that will allow societies like Switzerland um, to continue to thrive in the future. And maybe we can call this instead of ed tech or clean tech uh, or health tech. Maybe it, maybe it can be dem tech. Um, and this really matters. When it really comes down to centralization versus decentralization, I wanted to close with this image. This is an image from outer space, from NASA. Um, this is not an island over here, and that's not, a, um, not part of the ocean. It's actually North Korea and South Korea. So in the South, you see this incredible, miraculous economic, political diversity. You have Hyundai and LG and Samsung. And you have a government that's, that's so decentralized that it could literally throw the last two or three of its leaders out who are now in prison on different charges. Um, with just a, an amazing event that happened last year in Seoul where more than a million people came out in the streets and were able to topple uh, you know, a democratically elected leader. In the north, the only export is suffering. There's nothing. It's just darkness. The only point of light is, is in the capital where, just like in the Hunger Games, um, Snow or Kim Jong-un and his cronies have electricity and the rest of the population starves in District 12. And this is like the ultimate play out. This is the ultimate uh, reality of what happens if, if you go the extreme of, de of centralization versus decentralization in politics and society and economics. This is, this is what happens. Uh, unfortunately, we, have, we don't have to look in a, in a science fiction writer's head to, to figure out what happens. We have living proof. There's like 100, you know, close to 70 million people on this peninsula who every day are experiencing this. 50 million in the South who are experiencing it in a lot more friendly way. Um, so to leave you, I, I wanted to finish with this quote, uh, again from our friend Yuval Noah Harari. Um, and think about everything I've said about big data and AI, you know, being these authoritarian technologies and, and maybe these things like Bitcoin and IPFS and, and encryption being things that can help us as individuals. The algorithms are watching you right now. They're watching where you go, what you buy, who you meet. Soon they will monitor all your steps, all your breaths, all your heartbeats. They are relying on big data and machine learning to get to know you better and better. And once these algorithms know you better than you know yourself, they could control and manipulate you, and you won't be able to do much about it. You will live in the Matrix or in the Truman Show. In the end, it's a simple empirical matter. If the algorithms indeed understand what's happening within you better than you, authority will shift to them. Of course, you might be perfectly happy ceding all authority to algorithms and trusting them to decide things for you and for the rest of the world. If so, just relax and enjoy the ride. You don't need to do anything about it. The algorithms will take care of everything. If, however, you want to retain some control of your personal existence and of the future of life, you have to run faster than the algorithms, faster than Amazon and the government, and get to know yourself before they do. To run fast, don't take much luggage with you. Leave all your illusions behind. They're very heavy. Um, and I like that quote for two reasons. Number one, it really, I think, pithily sums up the struggle we have out in front of us. And number two, it t t tells us basically to be open-minded. You probably don't agree with everything I've said, or you maybe don't think Bitcoin can accomplish what I think it could be as like a, a, a really a foundational layer for a lot of very exciting decentralized technologies. But that's okay. Be open-minded about it. Do your own research. Dig in. Learn more. And I think you'll be interested in what you find. And I think this is important for us. Um, I'm so glad to be here at a, at, a, at a group of people talking about decentralized governance because I think it's so important. I think we need to fight the panopticon and invest in decentralization so that more of the world can have the fruits of society uh, that are available to people in Switzerland and aren't available to, to many, many billions of people around the world. So thank you so much for listening to me today. exciting talk. It's always a pleasure to listen Thank to you. what you have to say. Uh, I have one question when it comes down to decentralization. I really like the idea of Bitcoin and see uh, the, all the positive uh, say, uh, um, examples of people being in a very better position than they had or could have been in, in 20 years ago mm -hmm. because they were able to withstand, uh, say, censorship from authoritarian uh, regimes. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm very concerned about the control over the protocol improvements. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, can you give maybe a statement or uh, like your position about control of the GitHub repos, development of uh, like uh, one client software and uh, maybe where we can uh, distribute that or what actions are taken to distribute that. Yeah, I mean, I think what I would say is that um, 
speed is not your friend when it comes to changing uh, something that has so much riding on it like Bitcoin. I think uh, to the true sense of the word, you want to be pretty conservative about it. Um, like in the same way when someone is about to um, be confirmed onto a Supreme Court, you want that process to be slow, to allow people to ask a lot of questions. <laughs> you don't want to be speedy or hasty about it. You want consensus, okay? Um, in the same way, uh, I think with Bitcoin, um, you don't want anything jammed in there. I mean, you don't want anything to happen too quickly. Uh, I think, uh, you know, Bitcoin as a fundamental base layer for other things um, will probably evolve very slowly and primitively, and it'll probably only do a couple things really well, and then we'll have to build second, third, fourth layer technologies on top of it, and it's just going to be up to us to make sure that those second and third and fourth layer technologies are also relatively decentralized and private. Like, it's pretty cool that Lightning Network, you know, essentially operates with onion routing, for example. Now, these things won't solve anything if Bitcoin <coughs> continues to not have privacy or fungibility, for example. So there are certainly things that people need to tackle on that base layer that aren't, that aren't solved yet, of course. And, you know, we can have a whole separate conversation about um, how expensive it is to run Bitcoin. Uh, but ultimately, it does provide us something that I think is really unique in the world. Um, and that is a, a global network that's permissionless, that's actually censorship resistant. And that's something that I think is desperately needed in a world where there's just way too much censorship and, and repression. How do you see the role of plug wall? Of what? Plug wall. Can you elaborate on that? Company? Yeah. Uh, I, can you spell do, it? Do you like block one? Uh, block one. As oh, block was... one. Um, so, I will say that I am very excited about a lot of innovation in the space, <laughs> but I will say I will say one thing. Um, you know, again, I see a lot of these uh, comparisons in my head between what I've seen in political science and history, and then in, in blockchain governance evolution. And you know, there are people who will come in and say, "I promise freedom, I promise revolution, I promise something different," and then you realize later that it's you know, it's, it's no no really that different. So yeah, I mean, I think that the idea of having uh, these twenty one, uh, you know. Block producers is an interesting concept, and I think it's worth studying. I think it's unfortunate that there's that there's been some sort of evidence that, that some of these people have acted in sort of cartels, um, especially with regard to the sort of fuel that powers the system. Um, so, I mean, I encourage the community to really come together and think about how it can how it can how it can make that right and how it can make uh, EOS the platform that it should be. Thank you. Really enjoying the talk. Thanks. Uh, I was wondering if you can comment. On do you see any way to incentivize Chinese company to build more decentralized and censorship res resistant yeah. platform? And secondly, what do you, what role do you see in culture actually play for um, citizens mm -hmm. and their state to implement this kind of surveillance platform? Yeah. Well, look, I think culture is really important. I spend a good am I've spent in the last couple of years a good amount of time in Taiwan. I'm producing a large event there. In November, and I think it's an important counterpoint to like what people say. Oh well, you know, Chinese people can't have democracy or can't have this or that. I mean, it's quite clear that the Taiwanese built a pretty cool uh, decentralized governance model uh, with a very robust, uh, you know, creative environment of free expression, and it's a really amazing place. I encourage you to visit Taiwan if you can. And what's what's happening, <coughs> I think, is maybe it's not possible, given how repressive and strict things are, in, that are. The way things are getting in China is obviously going in the wrong direction for human rights with Xi Jinping being kind of crowned emperor. Um, but what's happening is some of the miners and developers um, who care about these things are leaving and they're going to like South Korea, Japan, Taiwan. And Taiwan has like a massive opportunity to become a real leader in the space. Because if you really think about what makes Taiwan special, it's democracy um, and, and tech innovation, of course, uh, being such a home for semiconductor innovation over the last 20, 30 years. So I think Taiwan has a great shot at becoming a real home for crypto, for really being blockchain island, and I encourage you all to visit Taiwan. Um, Jason Su, who's the uh, crypto congressman, is a good friend of mine, and he's working with us to produce this event that we're doing in, in November, and I, I hope it, it has a lot of uh, Chinese culture in it, um, and I think that that culture has, you know, I, I think no culture uh, is at odds with democracy. I really don't think that's the case. I mean, if you look at a map, you look at Cuba and Costa Rica, Belarus and Estonia, you look at South Korea and North Korea, Taiwan and China, you look at Tunisia and Saudi Arabia, you have dictatorships and democracies in, in every culture in the world. Um, so it's not, I think it's a human condition, you know, and it's more about can, can humans figure out ways to 
uh, make, make power more distributed. I, I, I wouldn't want to blame culture um, for any sort of oppression. I think it's pretty universal. And, and the map shows us today that any culture can have a, a free society. I think that's really important. Thanks a lot uh, for your talk, very interesting. You had one slide where you present the miners as the executive body, the mm -hmm. developers as the legislative body, yeah. and the users as the judicial body. Mm -hmm. uh, could you uh, develop a bit more on why you sure. see the, the users as the judicial body? Yeah, I mean, and to me, I'm looking at it as the pol from political science. But it's interesting to me that the users who run the nodes um, get to decide what software to upgrade. I mean, it's not something that, that they, they just do in an unthinking way. They have to look at it. And if someone's trying to force something through that they don't want, they are going to opt to not do that. Now, of course, this can create forks, which I don't think is unhealthy at all. Um, I think uh, if more people could fork out and just do their own thing instead of fighting, the world would be probably a pretty more peaceful place. Um, but yeah, that's, that's why I think of it that way. And as much as the users get to decide what, what laws get used and um, the, the coders get to draw up what, what upgrades to the network there will be. And in, at least in Bitcoin, the, the miners who are expending all the energy to create and propose the new blocks um, really are kind of the power of the executive branch. And they all work in a pretty amazing unison, actually. If you look at it, it's kind of amazing how it all works, yeah. So then would you say that the miners are not users or what do you define as users? Well, I think anyone running a node um, would be a user. So you don't have to mine. I mean, obviously, you can run a full node at home. Then what about the, the coin holders? What about the coin holders? What the um, uh, I don't know. Maybe you and I can have a conversation about that and develop that. Uh, but these are, these are three kind of just general things I notice when I look at it. Um, I think coin holders might be users as well in some ways. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Sure, thanks. So thank you. That was a great talk. Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate the part about China and the uh, face of surveillance. Uh, and even from a personal perspective, so I live in China for quite a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, my wife's also Taiwanese, so mm -hmm. you guys should definitely visit Taiwan. By the way, it's absolutely right. Uh, I think one thing you probably didn't mention is that that type of surveillance can only work with the people's consent. People actually have to be part of that system consciously agree to be part of that system. So from a Western perspective, we have to look at this as like, this is Orwellian. But actually, if you live in China and understand the local, the mainland Chinese mentality, most of the people I know in all my years, they actually would look at your presentation and say, no, I do not agree. Mm -hmm. I think the centralized system is better. Mm -hmm. And we're talking millions and millions, probably billions of people future would vehemently agree with us, disagree with us, could yeah. argue. By the way, it's not only algorithms. Uh, the golden shield can only exist because, you know, people. It's not only algorithms filtering the, the internet in China, it's actually buildings. Buildings, endless, full of people. I know, I've been in a few of them. So, it actually is more than just a system the culture, it's the mentality. Uh, and I know it's difficult for, for us to grasp all of this, but how would you and any of us convince someone that is perfectly convinced, having all the information, all the facts, that they want that system instead of a free decentralized system? Would we force that person? And how would we convince someone that is already convinced that they have it? Yeah, it's a great question, um, and it, it's not just China. Again, I don't want to pick on one country. I used it as an example because it's the largest country in the world, and it has a particularly interesting way that it, technology has innovated there. Um, but uh, I would be pretty bearish on any sort of change in, in, from what you're talking about. You're, cor you're absolutely correct. Um, if you surveyed 100 million people in China, of course almost all of them would say that, that they would easily, happily trade any sort of personal freedoms for security and for national pride and for national national greatness. I mean, that's quite, quite, quite well documented, of course. Um, and I'm not really sure that there's a way to turn that around. I'm not very bullish on, on you know, there being like a lot of free 
uh, innovation uh, and, 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 and creativity and free expression in China anytime soon, um, which is sad, but I, I mean, I think it's a lesson for the rest of us that it, it does take consent, right? So we get lazy, you know, when it comes to fighting for freedom, um, we could slip into that easily here. I mean, you might think Switzerland, the United States, Chile, uh, Japan, oh, we have free countries that could never happen here. I mean, it, you, you don't want to think like that. I think you have to, you know, the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. You always want to be careful and you always want to look at how can we protect um, the, the power structure we have. Um, because I do think that the writing is on the wall for China to be the world's power in 50 years. They will probably be the dominant power in the world. Um, that seems pretty obvious. And I, I think we have to think about what, you know, what can we do to create technology that can't be manipulated by, by government that has bad intentions, whether it's Putin or Xi Jinping or um, the Saudis, uh, et cetera. Like, you know, countries that don't want, that don't care about their people in the same way um, or aren't basically accountable to their people, they're going to build technology just faster than we can, you know, because they don't have uh, a free press. There's no way to investigate what these companies are doing. There's no, there's no sort of accountability in the same way. So um, that's, what, that's where this is going to unfold first, and that's why you're seeing the sort of crypto battles happening in these countries first. Not in Switzerland, but in Venezuela. Absolutely. In Iran. Um, so sadly, I'm kind of bearish. Uh, I, I, I think you're going to see a lot of exciting stuff happening in Taiwan, and hopefully some of that can kind of like influence some of what's happening in mainland China. Yeah, I, I, I don't want to pass as being overly pessimistic. I think there is a way, uh, and we need to build it. As you said yourself, we need to be vigilant. Yeah. Uh, and it's also about economic prosperity, because people need to choose the, the systems that provide more economic yeah. prosperity to them. And you, you, could, you could say there's like maybe a Trojan horse theory, where like Bitcoin became very popular in China, and uh, maybe the government didn't really realize what Bitcoin was or how, how it worked, and they, maybe they just thought that if they just owned a lot of Bitcoin, they could control it. Now that's clearly not the case, and they're shifting, right, to, to, to ban literally mentions of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, and even the word Bitmain um, on social media, and they're encouraging people to talk about blockchain, right? So that's the way they've chosen, and this is all happening as we speak. They're creating a digital yuan. This is what you're going to use, um, and obviously investors are going to be very interested in it. It's going to make them a lot of money. So again, let's just be careful about what we build. Um, even if we go back in time a decade ago, when Western companies built the Great Firewall, basically, I mean, Cisco helped build that, right? So they were responsible for that. So I think Western European countries especially need to be very careful about the technology they build and who they sell it to. Aren't we going actually the other way in Europe? At, uh, for example, uh, the European Union, we're getting more and more fragmented, yeah. more and more authoritarian. So are we already going to that route? Uh, yeah, I mean, political scientists have basically said that the wave, the third wave of democracy has receded and now we're in like a stagnation period. And look, the, there's negative things happening in Hungary and Poland, obviously. But look, for every Hungary or Poland, you have a Malaysia or an Armenia. I mean, there's really amazing things happening everywhere. So, I mean, it's hard to say. I mean, for me, the biggest problem was this way that Turkey and Thailand and the Philippines and Bangladesh it's a half billion people all went very backwards on political civil rights in the last five years. So that 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 those people in those countries are really feeling it the heat the worst at the moment. Um, but at the same time, there's positive changes elsewhere. You could be a student of Steven Pinker and just be a blind optimist. I don't recommend that. Um, but you should be aware that obviously, yeah, I mean, we are progressing pretty in a pretty amazing way, regardless of political structure, when it comes to quality of life, right? I mean, when it comes to 200 years ago versus now. So maybe don't be too pessimistic. Well, yeah. No, I'm actually quite optimistic. I just, you know, I see some new trends happening, and I think we should do something. Yeah. About those trends. Me too. I'm optimistic. Okay. Cool. Thank you for the talk. Thanks, man. I don't know if there's one more. Or... Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much.